spent one month on the beautiful Greek island of Lesbos, working on board a refugee search and rescue boat. Lesbos is known as the gateway to the European Union. And I was there because an NGO named ERCI, Emergency Response Center International, posted that they immediately needed boat crew. I'm a diver, and I also have a license for boats. I'm a captain, so therefore I responded, I booked a ticket, and I left the next day. I arrived at 10 p.m. at night, and I had my first shift at 5 a.m. So I came on the boat, and I met my great captain. His name was Nasos, and he looked at me, and he said, this is the first thing he said to me, Anna, how deep can you dive? And I said, well, I can dive to 30 meters. How come? And he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, good. When we have missing people, you are the one going down. And that's when I realized that it is a life and death matter for those refugees who are crossing the ocean. The first words that I was taught to say in case of a boat landing is you are safe, you are safe, you have reached the European Union. And so I did, many times. And the relief that I saw on their faces never changed. Now, I want you to take a good look at this picture. In particular, I want you to notice the man's facial expressions. A few moments before this picture was taken, this man thought he was going to die. On August the 18th, we had the worst weather that I've ever experienced on Lesbos. The waves were massive, the wind was blowing and pulling us side to side, and the visibility was really limited. And at midnight, the shore team phoned me and they said, we think we see a boat, we think we see a dinghy filled with refugees. So we rushed down, 10 minutes later, a boat with 45 people land on shore. Women, men, and children. They're all drenched. I started helping this African man get into dry clothing because he was shaking. And as I'm putting on socks, someone stands up and they yell, we have three missing people. So the boat crew, we rushed. We go and go and see the boat. And we jump in and we start preparing for a search and rescue. And we start heading out. And I'm thinking to myself, I can barely see in front. How am I going to see a person in the pitch black of night? But we start heading in the direction that we know the refugees came from. And at 1.55 AM, I spot a reflection of light in the darkness. And it's one of the missing refugees. He's lowered a lifeline from one of the big boats, and he's barely holding on. He's being tossed side to side, and there's no way they can pull him up. So we approach, and we throw out a life ring. First time failed. It floated past him. And I looked him in the eyes, and I could see the desperation. I tried a second time. I threw out the life ring. This time he got it. And I just kept yelling, hold on, hold on, you are safe. I'm pulling you in. When I lifted him up in that boat, he collapsed on top of me. He was exhausted. He had been in the water for five hours without a life jacket, in a full storm. He didn't believe that he was going to survive that day. And when I lifted him over to the Coast Guard, I didn't believe he was going to survive either. The next morning was very beautiful. And when I started my morning, I had a hot shower, I was eating, and I was just thinking about his morning. His morning had probably started with a smuggler telling him that to not worry about the bad weather, because they are told that the wind will get them across faster, that the bad weather will disguise them, that the big waves, it will push the boat so their journey across will go quicker. He had probably been hiding in the forest in Turkey for days, if not weeks, with no bathroom, no food, no idea if he was going to survive or not. And that really put my privileged life into perspective. But these refugees' journey, they don't start here. Maybe like Allah, he's a boy that I met, he's five years old, and he told me that he had to flee his home because it got bombed. Now, this is something I was told quite often, unfortunately, from children. I got actually used to hearing that. 
But what he didn't tell me, and what his dad told me a few days later, was that Allah had been standing next to his mother when there was an airstrike. The mother died, but her body shielded him so he could be dug out alive. Like Allah, they may have to leave their home village and trek across Syria to get into Turkey and to then get to the west coast in order to cross on a boat. And if they're from Afghanistan, like my friend Mohammed and Ahmed, they have to go into Iran. Now, Iran is 990 kilometers wide. That's 615 miles they have to trek on foot. And if they manage that, they go into Iraq. Now, if they're lucky, they'll get in a car boot or they'll get in a lorry. And then they will go over into Turkey where they join millions of other displaced people from the Middle East and Africa who are living in limbo in terrible conditions. Oh, and just so you know, Mohammed and Ahmed are boys who are 15 and 13 years old. And they did this journey alone. So with ERCI, we did swimming lessons for refugee boys. And I say boys because they're all minors. There was a surplus of minor boys because they are the first one to be drawn into the war. And therefore, families choose to send them first. Now these boys, on their journeys, as you can see how long it was, they had to get used to not eating for days, urinating on themselves, vomiting from the smell of their own urine, and constantly being scared of their own safety. Because how can you know if the person who's driving the car is someone who's gonna get you there safely, or someone who's gonna sell you into human trafficking? Now their parents made a conscious choice to send them, knowing these dangers, knowing that their sons can't swim, but they're gonna cross an ocean. They were desperate enough to do so to get their children out of the situation they were in. Can you imagine how desperate you would have to be to send your child willingly on a journey like that? So how do they cross? Well, so they pay smugglers between $300 and $2,000. Quite a lot of money. And they're loaded into these flimsy rubber dinghies. Now, I have seen and I've towed countless of these. They are made from really cheap material. They are cut out from stencils that the smugglers have, and they are super glued together. Now, you can see the pen outlines. If you look close, you can see the pen. And the bottom's not solid. There's water underneath. And if you step in, it's just completely unstable. And they come apart really easily. They are in no way secure. I wouldn't trust anyone to get into that boat. They are then forced to buy life jackets. And you're probably all thinking, but Anna, life jackets, that must be a good thing. It would be if they're not all fake and inefficient. What we use as inflatable toys, you can see the pink life jacket, is sold to parents as life insurance for their kids. If you read that in English, it says, do not use this life jacket, this is a toy. Now, if they're actually getting the real life jackets, it's not their weight class. It's never correct. If they end up in the water, they would drown. Now, once they're in a dinghy, they're forced to pick a captain. And what the smugglers do is that they will point at someone. It was like, you, come sit here. They'll start the engine, put their hand on the engine, and they'll say, just drive towards that light. You see the bright light? Head towards that. Just keep the engine still, and then they leave. This person's probably never been on the water. They have no idea what to do if the engine fails, if the boat stops, if they start taking in water. And in this boat, which is meant for 10 to 15 people, there are 40 to 70 people. It's just another way for the smugglers to make a profit. Now, I want you all to think about your first ever encounter with a refugee. And I'm sure there's some of you who are thinking, well, I never met a refugee. I can close to guarantee you that you have. Someone you went to school with, maybe your doctor, maybe your bus driver. And I'm asking you then to put a label on someone you already know. I'm asking you to judge someone that you already know. I'm asking you to look at someone that you see as a resourceful individual of this community, just as you and I are. The probability is that you met a refugee 
when you were young. But you didn't consciously realize that they classified as a refugee. Now, my first encounter was when I was 10 years old, and this girl from Liberia was introduced into my class. Now, she had escaped the Second Civil War of Liberia, which is a very bloody war. It was known for its child soldiers. And her parents had died, and she was there with her siblings. And when she came in, she sat down, and I turned to my friends, and I said, we should invite her to come and have lunch with us. Now, why is this such a big thing for me? Well, this is a big thing because no one objected. No one mentioned politics or stigmas, and there was no hesitation whatsoever. Of course we were going to ask her to lunch, because we were curious, and we saw it as an opportunity to make a new friend. Now, in the weeks that followed, we taught her Norwegian. She taught us French. Turns out she loved to dance. We loved to dance. It was a match made in heaven. And now, fast forward 10 years, she's the top of her class. And she's part of these amazing organizations. And she is such a force to be reckoned with. And I know that she will change the international community. As children, we don't box or label people. And that is a blessing, and it's a blessing that we lose as we get older. And there is something about going out and talking to people and getting to know them that shatters stereotypes. Now, you don't need to go to Lesbos, like I did, to make a difference. It starts here with everyday integration. Change and broadening of horizons start when you actively start seeking new information and you include others in it. By approaching what is different to you, you are broadening your horizon and you are challenging the fear of the foreign. That is a word we have in Norway called fremmedfrykt, and it literally translates to fear of the foreign because it is implemented in you through media who talk about extremism, who talk about terror threats, who says the refugees is a threat to our society. And I'm telling you that that does not represent refugees as a whole. And by going out and talking to people, you will realize that. When I worked for Dogs Without Borders, I met a lot of refugees. I also met a lot of Norwegians, and I'm going to tell you, the refugees were the kindest, most open-minded, and generous people that I met. I was always invited in for coffee and tea and to chat. They also had the least, but they gave the most. And there was one guy in particular named Amir, he was from Kurdistan, and he told me that it had taken him two months to get to Norway. During those two months, he was in a box that was about this tall, this wide, for four days. He climbed into that box in the back of a lorry, and the driver shut it with nails. He had no way of knowing if he was going to be opening that box again, or how long that would take. But he still got into that box because he needed to leave to find a more secure place to live. When I was talking to him, he asked me, how much is the minimum I can donate? And I told him it's about $10. And he said, well, that's quite a lot for what I'm earning right now. And I was like, you know what, Amir, don't worry. And he said, no, you know what, Dark Stop Borders helped me when I was on my journey. I want to contribute. And he left the room. So I sat there. And I heard he was on his phone. When he came back, he said, Anna, I have been on the phone with two friends of mine. They are all for refugees. And we have decided that together, the three of us will donate $10 for a year. We will manage a way to scrape that together. That really touched me. He really made an effort to contribute. Now, by going out there and talking to people, you shatter stereotypes. When I walked door to door talking to people about Drugs Without Borders, all the stereotypes I had of refugees shattered immediately. They are a resource. And we are stronger when we are united. Now, for example, if I turn off the lights, most likely you are feeling a bit scared, a bit lonely, and probably a bit alienated from those around you. And when the lights come back on, I want you all to turn. I want you to look at your neighbors. I want you to shake hands, and I want you to learn their names. I mean it. Do it. Good.
Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I hope you all know their names now. So when I turn off the lights once more, how do you feel? You probably, yeah, better, good. You probably feel a little more peaceful because you know your community and you know those around you. So when the lights now go back on, I'm telling you that that's all it takes to know a stranger. And that's exactly how much it takes to shatter a stereotype. Now, if you have time to volunteer and money to donate, that's amazing. But there's so much more we can do to be one. By showing friendliness and connecting on a human-to-human -human level, it will go such a long way. So one of the nights when I was sitting and I was having one of my ships along the shoreline looking for boats, an older volunteer named Nora, she leaned in and she was like, Anna, do you know what's the most important tool to have at a boat landing? So I'd been there for about four weeks. I thought I knew everything by now. I thought I had it down. And I was like, what, Nora, tell me. And she pulled out a balloon. And I was like, a balloon? <laughs> I have a knife strapped to my thigh. I have a flashlight. I have a first aid kit. What am I supposed to do with a balloon, right? <laughs> Turns out that a balloon instantly calms down a child. So when the children step off the boats, if you blow off a balloon, and you give it to them, they instantly turn very calm. And when they are calm, the parents are calm. And in such a hectic situation as a boat landing, that is a blessing. Something so small, so easy, and yet it makes a world of difference. Thinking of humanity as one and us as equals is the way forward for peace within our communities. Now, I haven't touched upon the conditions for the refugees, and I briefly do want to do that. This is Moria. Moria is the biggest refugee camp on Lesbos. It's a former prison. It has very, very tall fences, as you can see, and there's barbed wire on top. It's controlled by the military. When I was there, I wasn't allowed in. I had to walk around, and I felt like I was in a zoo. I felt like it was a detention center where the refugees were fenced in for my safety. Like if I went to close, they would bite. And that is in no way a dignified life. All the refugees want is a dignified life in safe surroundings. And I dare say that that's something we take for granted. We don't even think about that. They do. In a report from UNICEF a month ago, they stated that 50% of refugee women are sexually assaulted when they make this journey, and that includes when they're in Europe. What if I told you that half of the women in this room today will be sexually assaulted within the next three months? Would that spur you into action? What if I told you that the neighbors you just learned the name of, their houses will be bombed within the next two weeks? in an airstrike that they have no control over, and they have to trek on foot through the United States to reach safety. Would that spur you into action? Now, my last day, one of my colleagues was in town, and he walked past a cafe, and he thought he recognized someone. He walked over, and there was a bunch of men sitting there. Turns out that one of them was the man that you saw at the start, and he told him he had survived. He'd been in the hospital for five days, but he survived. And he was sitting there with all these new friends he had made, drinking coffee and talking about everyday issues. And what I hope that you take from this talk is that you have the resources to make change. Should that be by just getting to know your neighbor, going into politics, or volunteering locally or abroad? We have the ability to create bridges and not walls, because we are the future. And I urge you to take advantage of that and make tomorrow a more unified, caring world than it was yesterday. Thank you.